T.C. Boyle is one of the most inventive voices in contemporary fiction. In his latest novel, Blue Skies, he transports us to waterlogged and heat-ravaged coastal America, reflecting dark mirrors between the two coasts, with the storyline shifting between Florida and California. In Florida, Kat struggles to find her way in a coastal resort town where she knows no one except her fiancé, who travels often for work but has recently inherited a beautiful but flood-prone beach house from her mother and her hapless nature-loving family who live near Santa Barbara. Alternating viewpoints between Kat, her eco-warrior parents, her brother, we witness the family as they struggle to adapt to the new normal, in which once-in-a-lifetime natural disasters happen once a week and take serious personal tolls on each family member who nonetheless struggle to keep moving forward and doing the right thing. T.C. Boyle is a novelist, a regular contributor to The New Yorker. He has published 18 novels and 12 collections of short stories. He's a distinguished professor of English emeritus at the University of Southern California. He is one of our favorite guests, and we welcome T.C. Boyle back to the roundtable. How are you? I'm doing okay, Joe, uh, considering the um, state of the world. Right now I'm in my uh, in St. Pete on my way to Miami uh, because of the Florida connection of the book. The tour is taking me south this time for the first time ever. So what do you make of Florida and its current state? <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to get into politics here, Joe, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I'm always fascinated by the, uh, the the flora and fauna. I can be very happy just going to the park and seeing what ants are in the grass and what lizards are climbing up the tree. Uh, I just arrived yesterday and I haven't been in Florida since uh, 2019 because of uh, there's this pandemic. I don't know if you heard about it in yeah. Albany, and uh, it was <laughs> it was a little difficult to uh, to travel. Uh, um, I'm looking at palm trees, you know, but I see palm trees in Santa Barbara as well. What I um, miss um, is uh, the Northeast, and I will be returning to give a reading at my alma mater in Potsdam, SUNY Potsdam, in October. And uh, I will see some leaf color, which we don't get much of uh, in uh, California. Obviously, the environmental issues that you're facing in California are extreme. The environmental issues in Florida are extreme. They're different, but they're extreme. They're both very extreme. And what was it about that that you wanted to explore within the confines of the novel? Well, exactly that, Joe. Uh, you know, I have a, a close friend, my former college roommate, in fact, who lives in northern Florida on the coast. And I live in Santa Barbara, uh, where we are uh, undergoing the 1,200-year drought. Now, we had a miraculously wet winter, but uh, it's uh, it seems like a, it's just a blip on the screen now. So I wanted to contrast the, uh, how one family might might deal with all this. We are all living in... The future that I predicted in my 2000 novel, A Friend of the Earth, which projects to 2026 uh, and, you know, talks about the climate disruption, floods, fires and a pandemic, by the way. (laughs) Um, This one is taking off from now and projecting a few years into the future just to examine what it's like now to have this new normal where we, as you said in your intro, we can uh, we can expect uh, Terrible, terrible weather events. For instance, uh, five years ago in uh, in Montecito, where I live near Santa Barbara, um, we had uh, a tragic occurrence. Uh, a fire had uh, burned the vegetation off the mountains, and uh, we had the once in a hundred year storm, and 23 of my neighbors were killed in the uh, ensuing mudslide, as it's called, debris flow. Debris flow, Joe. The, the rocks coming off that mountain were the size of Volkswagens, and there were thousands and thousands of them, and they take everything with them, everything, uh, whole houses, just <laughs> nothing, not a brick, not, not a pipe sticking out of the ground, nothing, just completely erased in the middle of the night. Uh, that's the kind, uh, kind of life we're living with, and of course, I had been evacuated prior to that because of the fire threat from the Thomas fire. And meanwhile, my you know my roommate out here in uh, in Florida, uh, he's dealing with the king tides 
and ocean level rise, of course, as the Greenland uh, glaciers are melting, uh, we uh, coastally uh, people have to deal with that. And I just wondered in my scenario that I'm creating in this novel, what is it like for us now, all of us, to try to live a normal life under abnormal conditions? One of the things that I, I find interesting in you talking about your, your previous novel in, in which you looked at some of these issues and, and what would come, obviously you didn't want to be right, I would think. <laughs> no, no. In fact, Joe, I'm sure we've talked, we probably talked in this interval uh, on your show. Um, by 2015 or so, what I thought was going to happen in 2050 was already happening. And I, I joke that I should have, uh, you know, had a shorter time frame on the novel. 2026 you know, is how far I projected <laughs> T.C. Boyle is our guest. His new novel is Blue Skies. It is published by Norton. When it comes to uh, the characters, let's begin with Cat. Uh, Tell us about Cat and, and the situation Cat is in. Well, she's the heroine of the book, and when the book opens, we see her. She's just moved to Florida three months ago because her boyfriend uh, slash fiancé, Todd, his mother died, and he inherited a house on the beach, a beautiful beach house, which, of course, a young couple could never have afforded on their own. So they make a stab at it and go out and live there. As the book opens, Todd, who is something of a perfectionist, is getting his car detailed. And he can't just let them detail it on their own. He's got to stand there and kibitz and so on. Um, meanwhile, here is Kat. What's she going to do while the car's getting detailed? So she's just wandering around. Uh, thinking in her mind, because it's so incredibly hot and dense, thinking mojito. You know, it's the afternoon. Maybe a mojito would help. And she's also a, a good shopper. Uh, she is an online influencer. But there's not much to buy in the neighborhood where they detail cars. But she comes across this shop called Herps, which sells snakes as pets. And she winds up buying a Burmese python as a kind of fashion accessory to wear around her neck for photos on the internet and when she goes out for cocktails. The the python is, is becoming really a fascinating thing to write about, isn't it? It's uh, it's invasive species, but it's it's so prevalent in Florida that it's it really literally and figuratively is taking over. Yeah, I'm fascinated by the idea of invasive species I think something like 95% of the species living in San Francisco Bay are invasive, and of course coming from ships discharging uh, uh, their their bilge water and so on. Um, yeah, I've been quite fascinated by the Burmese pythons for some time. In my novel, since I'm projecting into the future, I have fudged it a little bit and and had the uh, snake advocates overcome the law <laughs> and and allow them to be imported. Still, in any case. Uh, people have let them loose. There was a hurricane and a breeding facility that, that, that let them loose also. And uh, almost all mammalian life in the Everglades is gone. Mm. And a lot of avian life, too, into the gullets of this invasive species. They've All, all the mammals are gone. There's no, no foxes, no, no shrews, uh, no beavers, no muskrats, all gone. And uh, they're they're uh, they're eating alligators now too. Your your novel, this novel, your previous work. I mean, it doesn't look to obviously um, solve climate change, but you you certainly look at it in the in the background as what these characters are dealing with, and and the connections are made as to how dire those circumstances are. Yeah. Um, again, all of my books. I just derive from um, an idea of my wanting to find out about something. Uh, what is it like for us all to have to live in, in this future? And what is the future beyond that going to be like? Yes, it looks pretty grim. But on the other hand, there are hopeful notes in the book uh, and hopeful notes in our lives. For instance, when I was a boy growing up in New York, uh, we had no notion of recycling. It didn't even exist. It, you know, Products were infinite. You threw everything away. Uh, you know, we there was no green uh, economy or no notion of it. So we are improving things. And I am an ecologist, and I, I'm all for it. 
On the other hand, there are now 8 billion people on the earth. And the climate change is irreversible, no matter what they're telling us, uh, because there's no way to shut off the tap. Um, and so it's a conundrum, and it's depressing. Um, and I just want to try to deal with it in my fiction to see how it might be. What are the possibilities? When we started our conversation, you say, as you know, I asked you how you're doing, and you said, as, as well as to be <laughs> expected. I, I'm curious how you've how you have managed your your life as as we go through these periods of such uncertainty and turmoil. Like everyone else, we live day to day. We have our ambitions. We create our art. We are a beautiful species. Wow, I have my work. And I spend a lot of time outdoors. I love nature. I like to be alone by myself, deep in the woods or uh, on the beaches. And of course, in the woods, because I'm such an ecologist and altruist, I, I feed the ticks a lot. I mean, they, uh, they need to live too, you know, and they have their mm -hmm. babies and they, they want, which is what we want. <laughs> the entomologist, uh, who is the brother of Cat in the novel, his name is Cooper, he studies butterflies, and his girlfriend is an acarologist. This is uh, a student of the tick. And I had written the scene, which you know, Joe, where um, he goes with her in the field to collect ticks to study. And the way to do this is you drag a, a white sheet through the bushes, and uh, when it falls on it, you may, may find some ticks and so on. But on this particular day, it was very windy. Again, because of climate change, the winds are extraordinary, um, seasonal winds there. And they got nothing. So they went to a bar and danced and drank and had fun. And they went home, and while he was getting ready for bed, he looked and noticed that on his right forearm, there was a tiny, tiny tick attached, a, a larval tick. Tiny, so tiny you could barely see it. And that was the end of that scene. And the next chapter well, went back to their mother, Adelie. Meanwhile, <laughs> there's a certain voodoo involved here. Within a week after that, I was hiking out in the chaparral, and the same thing happened to me. Uh, 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 a larval tick bit me, and it didn't transmit just Lyme disease. It transmitted cellulitis, which is a bacterial infection of the skin. And my entire forearm was as a blistered red horror. Uh, this was during COVID, so I couldn't go to the doctor. I showed it to him on my phone, telemedicine, <laughs> and he uh, made his diagnosis and gave me uh, clindamycin, a heavy-duty antibiotic, which it was touch and go for a while, but finally cleared it up. And the beauty of this, by the way, is he told me to take a magic marker and outline you know, the, the infection on my arm. Right. Uh, just to see if it's growing. And it did. It grew way past that and all the way on the other side of my arm and everything else. And I was a little bit concerned. And, of course, I inflicted this on my character immediately. I, I just had a, a nephew who, who got bit, and it was the same thing. There's there's this ring, and then you suddenly see the, it grow and get redder and redder and redder on the outside, and it's 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 quite disturbing. And then ultimately, and I assume this is the case with you, they find the right antibiotic that, that knocks it out. Right, but of course we live in a world in which the uh, the bugs are beating us. Um, there are multiple drug-resistant uh, strains of bacteria out there. I wrote a story about it, the, uh, the tuberculosis, for instance. Um, uh, we just hope that these antibiotics keep pace with the development of the uh, bacteria and viruses of the world. And uh, in this case, the, the uh, parasites that, that carry them. And you know, evolution is beautiful. You know, I don't mind a tick biting me. Okay, you know, it's just minor annoyance. And it had been in the past. But now uh, they are carrying not only Lyme, but now cellulitis. And uh, there are several other things that they're carrying as well. It's, uh, it's a little frightening. You can't even go out into the, into the woods anymore. Yeah. I mean, you look at this as a bug apocalypse in the book. Well, the bug apocalypse refers to what really got me going on this novel in the first place, insects. Right. Uh, uh, I had read a, a couple of news articles around 2017 in which this uh, German entomological society, the Kreffel Society, 
and had been studying as amateurs, bug populations, uh, for years and years and years, were discovering that flying insects were in decline. And I began to wonder, well, okay, so who needs mosquitoes anyway, uh, you know, or, or horse flies? But then you have to think about the food chain and the bottom of the food chain and what it might portend for us. So I began to study entomology, and uh, this is why we have uh, uh, Cooper as an entomologist in this book. And by, by the way, we should mention his mother, Ottilie. There are three characters, and we get each each one's point of view. Ottilie, their mother, uh, is like many of us, like me. She wants to reduce her, her footprint on the earth, and it has come to her that... Uh, Meat eating, of course, uh, causes a lot of uh, ecological destruction and and pain for for the animals and, and the slaughterhouses and so on. And so she decides to change her diet to insects and to incorporate insects in her diet. And those who read the book will find a few recipes uh, in case they're right. interested for <laughs> cooking delicious uh, insect-based <laughs> cuisine. And and I assume you you try that. I have. Yeah. I have indeed, but I don't eat much meat anyway, uh, so <laughs> so I will leave the chapelinas to you, Joe. <laughs> Ottilie says in the book, life went on, of course it did, no matter how many blows you had to take, and this was as bad as it got, this brought her to her knees. Yes, well, that's referring to what happened to her son uh, as a result of his tick bite. I don't know if we want to quite give that away yet to the audience as the we don't want to give the climactic scene no of course there are some shocks and surprises in this book that's for sure Uh, um you know it's hard for me to to describe what i'm doing or what my method is but i suppose if you look back over many of my books yes it's a it's a realistic scenario but slightly askew and uh there is an, an element of satire here of course um a cat, for instance, you know, using a living animal and a dangerous invasive animal, for instance, um, as a kind of prop, as a kind of fashion accessory, which, you know, makes us wonder, I think, about how we treat the animal kingdom in general. My my last book, Talk to Me, this mm-hmm. is a book in which the hero is a, a chimpanzee. In, in a laboratory. Uh, it's about the language experiments of the uh, 1970s in which we tried to teach chimps our language with, uh, with mixed success. And, and, you know, I'm wondering, well, what do they need our language for? They have their own language. Blue Skies is T.C. Boyle's 19th novel. It is now out. It is published by Norton. You talk about the satiric elements of the novel, and do do you ever worry that 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 turns to to a degree of bitterness, or is is that just fine with you? I don't worry about uh, uh, about my work. I, it just evolves, and I follow it. Uh, of course, I, I worry over every phrase and, uh, and and the movement of the book. As far as its reception, no, I don't worry in the slightest bit. The people can take it or leave it. Um, I think satire is my my mode. It's the way I have always approached life. Um, things are are bad and getting worse. Okay, so let's laugh about it a little bit. Um, I have written other books in in other modes. For instance. Uh, I wrote a book called San Miguel about one of the islands uh, off of Santa Barbara in a straightforward, uh, straightforward, realistic mode because it seemed appropriate for the book. And I wondered if I could do that. But I think more naturally, I'm writing uh, satirically and, and humorously. Well, that's it. It's it's so funny. It's, it is it is humorously. And you you enjoy writing humor. Uh, it's my natural mode, Joe. Uh, <laughs> I, I have been called a wise ass by uh, some some fan on some forum somewhere, and I I, I cop to that. I guess I am, and always have been. Uh, it's a it's a way of uh, of relating to the world, 
which is a mystery to us. You know, there is no reason for us to be here, and we want reason. We want purpose. Um, everything is a mystery. How do we address it? Well, I think we have to make fun of it and make fun of ourselves uh, to, 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 to get through the, the, the misery and the dislocation of just human consciousness in general. Do you feel, and, and that idea of misery, do, do you feel sort of relieved when you've written a, a, a novel and, and sort of look at it st- satirically, that it gives you a, a place in your mind that you can, can better digest it, or, or does it just lead to the next idea of what you can satirize? Well, um, it's like playing an instrument. You do, you do it for its own sake. You do it because it's comforting. Mm. Um, I have to be writing or I don't feel at ease with myself. I'm trying to figure out what we're doing here and who we are. Um, and by, by the way, if, if I figure it out definitively, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let you know, Joe. But uh, I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen. Uh, I think this is what art is. Art is a, a way of exploring our consciousness in a world of mystery joy and horror you know please i mean look at what's happening in the world not simply in terms of uh the 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 crash of the environment but in in terms of uh, people like putin for instance um the 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 fight for resources uh eight billion people what's going to happen where are we going to go what are we going to eat um i just can't help revolving these issues in my mind and uh studying them, reading about them, and finding scenarios to uh, to relate to it. Yes, I've written essays in the past. Yes, I'm happy to talk with you and, and others and mm-hmm. uh, express political opinions. But really, I don't know what my feelings are or how to express them unless I'm creating some fictional scenario. It's a joy. And as I said, it's like playing an instrument. You play your instrument and uh, you're improvising and you go where it takes you. Uh, you feel good about it. And, and, and maybe your audience feels good too, because your audience uh, feels the same things you do and maybe haven't expressed it either yet. The book is so funny and so moving, and it is uh, just a wonderful read. Blue Skies is the new novel. It is uh, published by Norton. T.C. Boyle, thank you so much for being with us. What a great pleasure to have you on the program. As always, Joe, I love your show, and I love talking with you. And to you. Thank you so much. Be well. Again, the name of the book is Blue Skies, a novel by T.C. Boyle. You're listening.